Hello, everybody, and welcome to North 100, a Canadian Highlander podcast. I'm Serge. Are you? I'm back ish. <laughs> Joining me are the people you're used to seeing, <laughs> Jaron Liam. How's it going, everybody? A reminder, this podcast is brought to you by you with your support at the Patreon at patreon.com slash run. Thank you so much. We couldn't do this without you. Let's start with the opening segment. We always do the best card that you're not playing. And up today, we have Liam. What you got? Uh, the best card you're not playing this week is Ojitai's Command. Oh. Uh, probably true. Yeah. Ojitai's Command, if you will. <laughs> uh, What's it do? Uh, so this is a four mana instant. Mm -hmm. uh, it costs two generic, a blue and a white, and it has it's a modal card. So you okay. get to choose two. You get to return target creature with your mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. You get to gain four life. You can counter a creature spell, or you can draw a card. Um, so this card's really powerful because they keep printing more and more really powerful true drop two drops. Yep. And beforehand, when there were only a couple of good targets for the first mode of this card, it was a little underwhelming in the decks that could cast it. Now. Um, there's cards like Dire Fleet Daredevil that got, have gotten printed somewhat recently um, that really uh, make this card a lot better, basically. And so as, and I think this is a card that's just on an upward trajectory, they're going to keep printing good two drops. And, and as long as they keep doing so, this card's going to get better and better. The fact that it just, for four mana, also just like uh, cycles and gains four life, like that's fine. If you ever get to cast it as Dismiss, like where it's counter target creature spell draw card, that's actively very good. Um, there's just like a lot of really powerful modes, uh, like against Jared at the at the tournament this weekend. I got to cast this as draw a card, get back Dire Fleet Daredevil, Dire Fleet Daredevil, your Mystic Confluence, bounce two of your creatures, draw a card. Pardon? Yeah, so it was good. Uh, that, that it only has two modes. How do you do like eight things? Well, because then you get back another modal card. <laughs> so, so I I mean strictly I chose five modes in the resolution of two spells. Holy moly. Ne next level charms deck. Yeah, it was a much much better. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, this card's really powerful. Um, you want you want to play it where in a deck where the second mo the first mode is powerful. Yeah, uh, you have to have two drops in your deck to want it. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the deck I was playing it in was like a, a sort of Jeskai control deck, but it had like Snapcaster Mage, Dire Fleet, Daredevil, um, uh, Sarah Avenger, the White White, three yeah, three yeah, yeah, Vigilance yeah. Flyer, Young Pyromancer, Young Pyromancer, I think in the ice. I never thought this made the cut. Cool. It's um, it's recent. It, it's certainly like like I think Dire Fleet Daredevil and Thing in the Ice were maybe the cards that pushed it over. Okay. But you needed a few more targets. Initially, people were like, "Oh, get back your Jace Prince Prodigy." That's that's what it did at standard. Um, and get back your Snapcaster. Hmm. But that's not enough. It's got to do other stuff. But now it does. And so I, I think this card's good. It's very spicy. Yeah, one of the important things with the modal card is that it has a good default mode. And the gain four draw card is a good enough default mode that you're usually pretty happy hmm. including it. Like, if nothing else is happening, you can still cast it for gain four draw. Yeah, in my mind, this is always strictly worse Cryptic Command, but I guess it's got enough It's got enough going on now, eh? It's still not the, better than Cryptic it's Command. It's not better, but the upside can be reasonably yeah. close to Cryptic. Because hmm. just, like, there are a lot of situations where you just, like, need to close a game out, and sometimes this gives you a threat, whereas Cryptic Command doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Cryptic can often just be Fog, hopefully, draw an answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let us talk about today's theme, which is going to be the Core 19 set review. But first, uh, I want to talk about two things really exciting. First up uh, is GP Vegas. Uh, this is the first chance I have to talk about GP Vegas. Unfortunately, I had completely lost my voice in the first podcast since we got back. But a huge, huge, huge thank you uh, to everyone I got to meet while I was down there. It was Unbelievable! There's a lot of people who, uh, who who like this podcast, Sweet. Yeah. and I got to meet a lot of them. So thank you so much, everyone who came up and said hello. That was great. Thank you to everybody I got to play Canadian Highlander with. A lot of people brought their decks down there, and getting a chance to jam some games at a GP was incredible. So I just wanted to give a shout out to everybody I met down there. So thank you for that. And a little bit more recent news: uh, recently down in Seattle at the Mox Boarding House, there was a massive Highlander tournament, which both of you guys got to go down. And how'd that go? It was sweet. There was, was awesome. Fifty-seven people. That's a good turnout. That's the biggest, biggest Highlander tournament ever, we think. <laughs> uh, well, we're not certain, right? To, to the best of our knowledge. But yeah, is. to the best of my knowledge, is the the biggest Canadian Highlander tournament ever. Um, yeah, it was super fun. Um, <laughs> I only got to play th three non-Victorian players, which was oh really sub yeah <laughs> suboptimal. In how many rounds? Six. In got, six rounds and fifty-seven yeah. players. You mm -hmm. wow. But uh, met a bunch of people. So shout out to everyone we met. Um, really nice to to see you all. Talk to everyone. Uh, yeah. Another thing I want to say is that the tournament was really really well ran. Nice. Yes. Shout out to Card Kingdom and Mox Boarding House for putting on a a mm. sweet sweet fun event. It was there were some awesome people there. Got to see a. A Hall of Famer jamming, Ooh. jamming Canlander. So that was that's rad. That was cool. Very yeah, cool. Randy, Randy Bueller was playing. Nice. What was he on? Uh, Jazz Guy Tempo. 
Yeah, it was still pretty mid range. He had a, he had a couple. He, of six he was calling a tempo. He had disrupt <laughs> in his deck. In fairness, oh man, very he nice. He also had a six drop in his deck. <laughs> Which six drop was he playing? Inferno Titan, Titan. Torrential Gear. Oh yeah, okay. Right. Torrential. Well, yeah, yeah. Hard to resist so. playing that one. Yeah. All right, let us get started. So as usual, we're gonna go through in Wooberg order. Uh, Graham, I I sent you an email with the card order. If you want to follow along. No, I should have organized this a little bit ahead of time. My apologies. Panic. I was just frantically checking Panic. Google Drive to see if you had shared anything with me. Yeah, I, I, I shared it while I was up it. here because we're getting. I sent it to you uh, over G. Like I sent you the link in your email. Panic. We're getting started. I was like, I didn't share the list with Graham. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna very sneakily, and it's entitled "Urgent." Yeah. So that there are some other. You, you could just start. I have the card image gallery. All right. All right. So the first card we're gonna talk about today is the new Johnny. A Johnny and. Adversary of Tyrants. This is a four drop for two white white. Starts with four loyalty, plus one. Put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures. Minus two. Return target creature card with CMC two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Mm. Minus seven. You get an emblem with, at the beginning of your end step, you get three cats that have lifelink. Jer, want to start us off? Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to start us off and say I think this is the best of the Planeswalkers from this set. Yeah. Op optimistically. Uh, you really need to be playing a bunch of creatures yeah. to play it, but I think it it's, fits into a, an existing deck pretty well. Like, it fits into any green-white deck, like, reasonably well. There's a lot of two-drop or less creatures you want to buy back, like Voice Resurgence, Kasali, Pride Mage, yep. Scavenging Use. The list goes on. Uh, Selfless Spirit, and especially the ones that put themselves into the graveyard for benefit Value. are really nice to be able to bring back. Uh, I really wish the plus one was distribute as you choose, because as it stands, if you only have one creature, you're only getting one counter, which is a little disappointing. Mm, so plus take one, two I... plus one plus ones and put it on over. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah I, I think the plus one's actually not that strong, which makes it a little hard to evaluate from my standpoint. I think I'll need to, need to play it a bit. Hmm. The, the ultimate's really good at winning you the game. That, yeah. That's going to take over really quickly. It's but. tough if this makes the cut over like three mana and Johnny. That does something fairly similar, but has a lot more punch. Yeah, the one thing that's really nice about this is that if the board is currently empty, this is likely giving you some board presence because hmm. the odds are that you didn't play a one or two drop earlier on are super low, so you yeah, can probably minus, it, minus it right away to to get something in play, whereas the three mana Johnny, a Johnny Color of the Pride, I think it is, yeah. uh, has no way to impact the board. Until yeah, you just plus and ultimate. hope you get a creature. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm I'm a little optimistic about this card. Yeah, we'll we'll see how it plays out. Very cool. All right, next up we have Cleansing Nova, which is the new Wrath from the set. So five mana, three white white. You get to choose one, destroy all creatures, or destroy all creatures and artifacts. Oh, pardon me. Destroy all creatures or destroy all artifacts and enchantments. Holy moly. That would be a good one. Yeah, Liam, start us... Well, not start us off. Continue. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the the Charms deck got a real Wrath now. Um, this this card, I think, is pretty good. Five mana Wraths have typically not been playable in Highlander on average um, because the upside they've presented is usually not enough. Like cards like Hallowed Burial, sure. where they put all, the, put all the creatures on the bottom, like... It's just not quite enough. It's just worth it to play a, a Wrath that's one mana cheaper. But the fact that this is going to have utility in both their creature matchups and uh, a lot of the combo matchups yeah. is pretty huge. Yeah. Um, like in particular, right now, like Paradox the Academy Ramp. Yeah, like the sort of Academy Ramp decks are reasonably popular. And, and this is just like insanely good against those sorts yeah. of decks, right? Mm -hmm. It's like. Lights out, good Holy night. moly. <laughs> yeah, you, you cast this and you, and you win the game. So so giving like the blue, the blue white or the white X control decks another kind of haymaker in those matchups is definitely really good. So. I expect to see this played. Uh, I think it's going to be a bit more of a meta card, but I think it's a good card. Sure. I agree. Uh, next up, we have Isolate. Isolate is a one-mana instant spell for white, uh, and it says Exile Target Permanent with CMC 1. Jer? Uh, this card is cool, but I don't think it's it's good enough for Highlander. There's just too, too high a variance in the mana cost. Yeah. This isn't a 4x Deathrite Shaman format, and even all the black-green decks don't even play Deathrite Shaman. Yeah, this is so. a modern Death Shadow or something, right? Yeah, it, it might be a neat modern sideboard card. Yeah, I was thinking sideboard card. it hits Amulet of Vigor and Death Shadow, which is, like, kind of cool. But, yeah, there's, there's just not enough targets on average for it to be playable in Canadian Highlander. Just because we sort of uh, 
windmilled very quickly into doing the actual review. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to remind the listeners just like what what the purpose of a set review on this show is. Yeah, absolutely. So for our North 100, um, we're reviewing the cards that we think are relevant specifically for Canadian Highlander. Um, so there's a lot of cards we're not talking about because in our mind, and in, you know, Jaron Liam just did an episode on, on how we evaluate cards. Is a card worth talking about? Is it playable? Is it fringe playable? Or do we anticipate somebody's going to ask us a question? So our, our lens comes from the point of view of, is this going to make a splash in our meta? Or is this going to make a splash in our comments? And we want to sort of, uh, <laughs> and sort of and te- yeah, preempt the, the conversation ahead of time there. So Isolate is a card that we think we're going to get a lot of questions from. Uh, we think it's very interesting. We think it's a very well-designed card. Uh, but we don't necessarily think it's going to see a lot of play in our format. Um, so if you if you sort of listen to all the cards we talk about through that lens, it should help guide a lot of the conversation from where we're coming from. Yeah, and if you have any questions about cards that uh, we didn't get to uh, try checking out the the last episode, the card evaluation episode, mm. if you get a chance, because that might give you a bit bit more insight onto why we didn't talk about it. We sort of gave you a rubric of how we evaluate cards for Canadian Highlanders, so that might give you the tools you need to figure it out. That being said, please still feel free to comment. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're not trying to not answer questions. We just want to try and answer them ahead of time. Yeah, and then, you know, who knows? Maybe there's so many cards in the comments after, like, all right, follow-up episode. We hacked up. Here we go. Part two. <laughs> all right, let's move on. The next card we want to talk about... Oh, sorry, did you have anything else you want to say about Isolate? Nope. All right. <laughs> the next card we have is the Lanin War Leader. Four mana, four, four kitty for two white-white. It's a cat soldier. Whenever it attacks, create two 1-1 one, one white cat creatures with lifelink that are also tapped and attacking. Jer. You're not Jerry, you're Liam. That's correct. Liam. Um, so this is kind of, uh, it's worse than... Um, Hero of Bladehold? Hero of Bladehold, yeah. yeah. But not a lot worse. And I the, li- the lifelink the life link matters a lot. I don't think it's super different. Uh, it, the clock's mm. slower, but the, uh, but the lifelink like, sort of shores that up. But I think if you were going to play one of the two, you would play Hero still. Um, but I do think this card's very cool. And I, this is going to sound like a joke, because I make a joke about a lot of tribal decks, but like there are now more and more cards that care about cats. Yeah. Um, so, like, look, I'm just saying, Regal Caracol is a playable magic card you on its own. You even pick the more playable creature type. Soldier? What, soldier? <laughs> no, no, no. Soldier <laughs> decks are old news. Cat decks, new news. <laughs> Jerry, you're really um, excited about this card. Why are you so stoked on this card? I wouldn't say super excited, but I I seem to rate it the highest out of the three of us. Yeah. Uh, I just think it's sort of a cool meld between, like, Brimaz and Hero of Bladehold, and I think there is a niche... For it, like, if if you're playing it against like a red deck, it's equally as hard to kill as uh, Hero Blade Hold. Hero Blade Hold, and the Life Linkers are actually better than having two ones. I think in that matchup. Hmm. So anytime you're racing, uh, there's a chance it's better. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Life Link really starts to to add up. Like it, it's addition additional growth for Life Link. So that's a big deal if they're not killing your killing your creatures. Yeah, I just think any sort of of the army in a can creatures have have a lot of potential in it, especially with the the advent that a lot of aggro decks have started playing like mana crypt as points. I think this has potential to interesting to see play the, the two there. I like the idea of cat tribal. We're gonna we're gonna do a little bit of brewing after this. Maybe uh, you could just search cat. It's not that big a search yet. <laughs> it's coming probably, along. You probably have to play them all. All right, all right. Next up, we have mentor of the meek. Three mana, two, two, for two and a white. Human soldier, notable. Whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay a generic. If you do, draw a card. Jer. Other Jer. Actual Jer this time. Oh, no, it's actual Jer. All right. Uh, (laughs) So this is a reprint from original Innistrad. Uh, This card hasn't seen as much play with the uh, printing of Bygone Bishop. That card's the same mana cost, two and a white, for a two, three flyer that whenever you cast i think it's cast that one yeah whenever you cast a creature soul with cmc three or less so like not quite the same but very similar sort of similar you get a clue and i think just the ability to sort of stack your clues up and not have to dump mana when you when you cast your spells is a really big deal especially for the aggro decks where they just want to get all the cards out of their hand as quick, yeah. Then refill. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like if you're beating somebody down, you don't want to not play a one drop to draw a card in an, in an aggressive deck. You really just need to get all the pressure 
on board you can a lot of the time. Like sometimes you want to sandbag stuff because you don't want to get wrathed and then mentor the meek's really good, but yeah. it's just for me, mentor just costs too much mana. Mm-hmm. That is my big issue with mentor the meek at that you're very rarely going to get like multiple card draws a turn out of it. Mm. Uh, and it is just an issue whether it's just like our other cards that are better. And Plus, another, another, Spirit Cleric is a better type line than Human Soldier. That's not true. Um, <laughs> Both Spirits and Clerics better, I think. There's also the the more relevant thing is that the 2-3 two, flying body is, is just yeah. vastly superior to the 2-2 two, two on the ground. Like, because this is your engine card, you it's basically an enchantment. You're just never attacking, never blocking. You need to protect it. Yeah, and, and the flying is pretty good there. And this just often gets to chip in for like four to eight points of damage over the course of the game, which is a big deal. So high level Mentor the Meek, overall rating? Meh. Yeah? It's it's fine. It's fine, it, yeah. Especially, Mentor the Meek, I'll say, is more abusable, like, because it's when a creature with power two or less enters. So if you're doing some, like, crazy, like, aristocrats... Food chain. Shenanigans, it doesn't say non-token. Yeah. So, like, yeah, yeah, you can, you can food chain with a uh, squee. Squeeze the only one that works, but you can't use the food chain mana to pay the yeah pay yeah. the one. So all right, let's move on. Next up, we have the remorseful cleric. Two mana, two one with flying spirit cleric. Yep, relevant. Much Sacrifice it. Exile uh, all cards from target player's graveyard. Liam. Uh, so another cleric for the ever growing cleric deck. Uh, this this card is fine. It's not super exciting. It's not selfless spirit, which I think is a pretty yeah. analogous card to compare it to. That sets the bar real high, though. It does. Um, but this card's still pretty good. Like, exiling someone's entire graveyard is a, is a reasonable thing to do, and the fact that it's a flyer means that it's not insulting to play. Like, just playing a 2-1 flyer for one and a white in some decks is, is going to be acceptable. So I think I can see worlds where uh, this gets into mono-white decks, but I, I don't think it gets played in all of them. Uh, and, and probably, like, green-white. Um, like, bas- basically, like, yeah, like white X aggressive decks are, are probably fine playing this card, though it's not going to be nearly as ubiquitous as, as a card like Selfless Spirit. Yeah, great hate card, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I just think it's a little more meta dependent. Like if people are running around reanimating things or mind slaver locking you, then. Well, if, I'm, I'm sit- if I'm sitting across from Liam and I know he's on Tinfin, Remorseful is Cleric all day, you know? Yeah, yeah then you're you get can... to cast a two mana spell, eh? Then you... <laughs> I'm not just then dead you... on turn one. Then you can block Crystal Brand. Right? That's and and sack it to negate Good the response. lifelink. Yeah, yeah, yeah no lifelink. Mm. All right. Next up, we have the Resplendent Angel. Three mana, three, three angel for one white, white, as flying, as most angels do. At the beginning of each end step, if you gain five or more life this turn, you get a four, four angel token with vigilance, basically a Sarah Angel. And then three white, white, white activated ability until end of turn, give it plus two, plus two in lifelink. Jer. I think this card is better <laughs> than, once again, than most, most other people do. Apparently, I like white cards. Weird. And yet you don't want to play big white. I don't get it. it doesn't make any yeah, sense never, to me. Never. Um, but yeah, I just think the the three three for three flying body is like reasonable. It's yeah. already like above average. And then just the upside of having a three drop that potentially just wins you the game by itself is yeah massive. Like if you ever get one angel off of this, you're just like dancing in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we have been talking about angel tribal. Yeah. Have we? This, this gets right we into one episode. Gets, oh right, yeah. All right, gets right into Mardu Mardu life gain tribal. Yeah. Goes very well with Lichia Sanguine Tribune. Go on. Uh, just because you said most, what's there is one angel, A- angel that, that does fly. not have flying. Fallen angel. No, no, that one has. Flying. Ooh. It's from alliances. Oh god, I'm not going to know it. I wasn't born <laughs> when this set was printed. <laughs> Sustaining spirit. Creature, angel spirit. I was going to say, it didn't get errated to spirit? No. <laughs> it doesn't even have an angel in its name. It's, uh, no. It's, yeah. It, it, what does the arm angel, look like? It, here. Cumulative upkeep, one and a white. Any damage that would, re- cumulative, <laughs> any damage that would reduce your life total to less than one instead reduces it to one. Originally printed as summon guardian. Oh, it's another one of the guardians. I knew it was a guardian. Oh, We've talked about this before. Serge, Oracled. you missed us talking about guardians. Oracle to angel spirit. Why well, wasn't Oracle to wall? <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, or enchantment. Because it doesn't have defenders. Why wasn't it Oracle, Oracle to existence? enchantment? <laughs> it doesn't do anything. It's an O3. All right. Why is it a creature? It's got to be bogged down in flightless angels. It's got to be boltable. All right. And our last card from white is the shield mare. Uh, 
three mana, two, three horse for one white, white. Uh, shield Mare can't be blocked by red creatures. When Shield Mare ETBs or becomes a target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, gain three life. Yeah, this is just another card to play against red. It's very powerful against yeah. that form, against that uh, color. Um, obviously, three life um, is better than two. So if you're comparing this to something like Kitchen Finks, oh, yeah, okay. um, like a lot of the time, so it's going to gain the three life for sure. And then what's nice is that the red deck is often looking to blow up your creatures to get through with their own. Yeah. And as a two, three, this is going to brick wall a lot of creatures and targeting it is a bit of a nuisance. Yeah. Um, add on to that, if you ever get to like, they target it with something, you counter that spell and you're your love in life. So yeah, it yeah. seems like a pretty powerful card. I like it a bunch. All right. Spe I'm sorry. Speaking That's of fine. creature types, there's this cycle of horses, right? Yeah. The okay. mares. Yeah, the mares. So Vine Mare and Lightning Mare, the green and red one, are both horse elementals. Sure. Ah. The black one is a nightmare horse. Classic. Right. The blue one is a horse fish. Strange, but okay. And the white one is just a horse. Well, that just makes sense. It's just a horse. They it's run, just a they white horse. They run around horse. on the plains. Look, this, they don't have to construe it to get in here. I don't know. And it's a little bit disappointing, right? What, why, why isn't this a special horse? Is it just like the OG horse? It's just a horse. White, right. white gets horses. That's just the way the what color pie works. All right. Let's move to blue. So does, is, oh, is a crowing horse a construct horse or horse construct? Uh, or is it also just a horse? Probably or just a, a construct. construct. Better be a horse. The survey says... Horse. Just horse. I knew it's it. not Col even a construct. Colorless also gets horse. But it's, I knew it. It's not a horse. It doesn't <laughs> make any sense. <laughs> Watsy, what were you thinking? I thought it was just Thera horse. Theros is, is home to a litany I'm pretty of sure I complained about slightly this, like, a slightly lot inaccurate five years Greek ago. mythology representations. But this <laughs> takes the cake. Although maybe it's a horse because they want you to believe it's a real horse. Well, exactly. There that's is the whole point. That's a good point. There is actually in the M19 cycle. There's Diamond Mare, which is the colorless one, which is also just horse. Oh, there you go. Jared just no scoped it. Can we talk about blue cards? Yeah. Okay. All right. First up, we have Mirror Image. Two and a blue for a zero zero shapeshifter. Bold. You may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature you control. You want to talk about this, Liam? This was your inclusion. Sure. Yeah. So um, obviously, this isn't as powerful as your standard clone, but it's cheaper. And so there are a bunch of decks in Highlander that are looking to leverage cards like Phantasmal Image. Um, like Pod is the deck that comes to mind the most. Yep. But there, are, but there are probably others that can that can play cards like that reasonably. And this is just like another card like that, somewhere reasonable on the curve. Like three is not an unreasonable spot to be playing this. And and in Pod in particular, just like getting to copy creatures you have on the board is often very good. I think the fact that this can only top, copy your own creatures is likely. Uh, gonna hold it back a little bit, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, is this is this the first three mana clone effect? I was just thinking like about that. Too. It it is. There's I, there's I Protean Rebel or whatever it's called, but you need to have attacked the blue red clone. Oh yeah, yeah. Hmm. Protean um, Raider. Yeah, Protean Raider. That's what it is. And then there's also Cryptoplasm, but I think that only does it on your upkeep. Yeah, maybe that's right. So, so I think this is, three mana this is the first clone? one that just like yeah. well, there's there's Phyrexian Metamorph, which technically costs three. No, but if you pot into it, it's four. So right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If we're assuming is, a pod chain sure, here, that's yeah, really relevant. Yeah. And so yeah, so just having another another clone on the pod line might be might be good. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, I didn't even think about that. I saw this card and I was just like, Liam, I'm going to need you to talk about your choice here. And uh, good choice, good evaluation. I I hadn't thought about that card. I did it. Next up, we have Nexus of Fate. Which I don't know what it does. It's a, it's a seven mana time walk that shuffles back the, into your deck. It's, it's really the exciting. It's buy a box promo. Really? Can you not get this in packs? No. Holy It's heck. only the buy a box promo. So it's five blue blue. Take hmm. an extra turn after this one. If it would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, reveal it and shuffle it into its owner's library instead. I mean, okay, I know we're not MTG Finance, but this card's going to be a million dollars. No, we're hashtag not MTG Finance. This card's going to be a million dollars! No, it's not. Why is a seven mana time walk good? Uh... Because there's a bunch of ways to combo with it. Go on. Any time you mill yourself, this becomes the only card in your deck, and then you take all the turns forever. Because it just keeps you shuffling You just need in. seven mana. This this plus Mystical Tutor goes infinite on its own? No, it doesn't. Yeah. How? And eight mana. How? How? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need a way to tutor it. Some, <laughs> someone else said that exact same thing, and no, I was no, just no, like... No, no, it does. You cast this. Then it shuffles into your deck, then you Mystical for it, then on your next turn you draw it. Oh, you need to get Mystical back. You need to get Mystical back. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. This it's not oh, a two-card combo. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Still good, though. Yeah. I was like, I, I haven't been gone so long and, that... Yeah. And the fact that it's an instant is a really big deal. The it's fact an instant? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Holy moly. For, for some reason. Why? Okay, okay. I looked at this card, and I was like, seven mana, pass. Yeah, so the fact that... Okay. It, so the the deck it likely goes in is there's a deck called Curb Your Enthusiasm yep. or Blue Green Blue Green Time Taking Turns. Deck. Yeah. yeah. And so that deck is a blue green ramp deck that looks to take <laughs> Graham. Graham, you like the t you having like the deck a name? laugh. Um, I just hadn't heard the name Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> it's it's like, miserable right, to play one. against. Oh my god. You're like really another time walk? You're like it's all my deck does. Slow zoom in on your opponent's face with the tuba pl music playing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, you correctly evaluated where the name came from. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's a blue green ramp deck that looks to take a lot of turns and slowly beat your opponent down with Eternal Witness, um, <laughs> as you take ten turns in a row. And so, so this enables you to pass the turn, potentially counter their spell, or just when they do something that's irrelevant, just take a take an extra turn. Uh -huh. Nope, I had no idea. That's actually really cool. Yeah. This, Why is this... it from anywhere? Yeah, that's it's dumb. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, so it all prevent, also prevents you. Like if your mm -hmm. opponent tries to painter stone you, and you this can't is in die. your deck, they just lose if you have seven mana, because they just mill your deck. This becomes the only card in your deck, and now you just take all the turns forever. This card's gonna be a million dollars. <laughs> oh my god! It's not gonna be a million dollars. All right. It might be like twenty. Yeah, that's a million. They next up, we have a reprint. Our good old friend Omni Science. Just kidding, Omniscience. 10 mana enchantment for 7 blue, 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 but you're not casting it too often. And it has the text that says, You may cast spells from your hand without paying their mana cost. You like this card, Liam? Tell me about it. Uh, yes, the old Omnis Kyans. Um, <laughs> well known combo card. So, yeah, so this card's a combo card. Yep. Um, you're finding it with Academy Rector, or you're casting it with Dream Halls, or you're putting show it into play off Show and Tell, and then typically you're then trying to win the game. Um, it's powerful in Canadian Highlander. Basically, that's I've described to you the shells that play it. Yeah. Um, you're not typically Fair trying to cast this. it yeah. ever. I've seen someone play it in High Tide before. They were on the like, well, I get to ten mana all the time. Might as well just cast this omniscience and win the game. It wasn't the worst plan ever. It wasn't the best plan ever either, but it was fine. Like cool. it, it, it makes sense. But yeah, so typically you're cheating this into play, and then you're winning the game with a card like Enter the Infinite yeah. or. Uh, just casting Ever spells cool. for free. Yeah, yeah exactly. Petals of Insight. Petals yeah. of Insight. Um, yeah, there's just a bunch of ways. So this is a, a good combo card. Yeah. Nice reprint. Nice to have it back, absolutely. Yep. All right. Next up, we have Psy, the Master Thopterist. Three mana, one four, legendary human artificer for two and a blue. Whenever you cast an artifact spell, create a one one Thopter. They get flying. And for one and a blue and sack two artifacts, you get to draw a card. I saw Jared just being like, <laughs> This card's so sweet. It's really good. It's really, really cool. Yeah, so this card just, like, feels its own ability. It's got four toughness, so it's hard to remove. It only costs three mana, which is great. Uh, the flyers can actually kill your opponent. Yep. Uh, which is also nice. Yeah. I might try it in battle lots. Just really, yeah, I think Like my little weenie deck? Yep. It's potentially where it goes. Like, any deck with draw sevens and a bunch of artifacts can potentially just get, get their opponent with this card. All right, next up, we have the Blue Planeswalker, Tezzeret, the Artifice Master. And we got to see this card do some pretty broken stuff in the uh, Loading Ready Run pre-pre-release. So five mana, three blue blue, comes into play with five loyalty. Plus one, you get a Thopter, just like we are talking about before. Zero, draw a card, or if you control three or more artifacts, you get two cards. At its ultimate, minus nine, you get an emblem with, at the beginning of your end step, Search your library for a permanent, just put it into the battlefield. Yep. Liam. So this is my pick for the second best Planeswalker in the set. Uh, uh, I actually think of Johnny's third. I think we... Okay. I Different think, order? We can, we can talk about yeah, that after. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I think the old Nickel Pickle might be the best one. Ah. Um, oh, I wasn't counting that one. Yeah, yeah. I thought you might agree with me when I mentioned it. That's fair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, so this card's powerful. It ticks up to defend itself, which is good. Yeah. Uh, that's something we always look for in Planeswalkers. The fact that it draws cards for a zero, not a minus, is quite nice. Yeah. The ultimate's powerful. I, I try not to evaluate Planeswalkers based on their ultimate almost ever, because I, I think you can often trick yourself into overvaluing cards by doing that. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see where this fits in. You that, were you were talking, Jar, about like building some kind of like artifact based mid range deck, right? That, I've been trying to for a while, and I just think you're like stuck on payoff cards, and then they keep printing more and more 
like artifact matters payoff cards like i really want to play the antiquities war i love that card mm -hmm. i really want to play phyrexian scriptures i love that card and like Psy and Tezzeret are also sweet cards, but that's my biggest issue with Tezzeret and why I rated it lower than a Johnny is a Johnny just has like a couple obvious decks where you can at least try it and he'll be, you know, at least serviceable. But I don't think Tezzeret has an obvious home. I mean, Juggernaut dot deck. I yeah. don't think that's good enough. But, but it, it's the, the weird, so the weird thing with this deck is where do you get value out of its ultimate, right? What permanence you want to put into play? I, I just don't think you care no, about the I ultimate. Don't. You just evaluate it on whether the plus one and the zero is good. And then I, if you ever get to ultimate it, like, you figure that out later. You ultimate it on the fifth turn, like, assuming nothing happens. So, like, you're just winning any game where you have a Planeswalker in play that's getting to plus. And the plus, once again, same as a Johnny, is, like, not that good. Like That's what I was going to say, because it's a five-mana artifact, that a five-mana spell that's only giving you Thopters or drawing cards. So it's so weird to evaluate just like that. I don't think you could ignore that last line of text. I think you need to find some amount of synergy there, because if you're just... No, no, but, you, but what Liam's saying is, like, in Highlander, the decks are so interactive, and, like, you can't just plan to be always ahead on board when you yeah, cast this. Yeah, yeah. So, like... Any any deck can take advantage of put a permanent into play. Yeah, like all, all I'm saying is like I'm not <laughs> building my deck with the strategy of like I'm gonna alter it Tezzeret, ultimate Tezzeret, and then get this into play. I'm gonna like build my deck uh, as a way that in a way that I think is good, and then if I do ultimate a Tezzeret, yeah, I'll figure out stuff that's good. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, like there's always that's, gonna be that's fair. it's yeah. always gonna be good to put stuff into play for free, right? You're like tutoring for the best possible permanent at all times, yeah, okay. and like. Obviously, you're going to play this in a deck with a bunch of permanents because you sorry, want sorry. artifacts. The, the, there's a lot of subtext there. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're all on the same page. All right. And the last blue card we're going to talk about in slightly unalphabetical order is the Surge Mare. <laughs> My card. Hi. Blue, blue for a 0 5 horsefish. Uh, can't be blocked by green creatures. Did I say it's an 0 5? I did. Yes. Yeah. Whenever Surge Mare deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card, but you also have to discard a card. And. For one and a blue, Surge Mare gets plus two, minus two until end of turn. Jerry, you like this card. Tell me about it. Yeah, so I think this card is potentially pretty good in Mono Blue Devotion. Uh, five Toughness is really, really good against red decks. Uh, and it's just sort of one of those cards that in blue decks, like, eventually you just get to start attacking your opponent. And if you don't think they have anything, then they're like, you're like, take four, take hmm. four, take four. And they're like, now I'm almost dead. <laughs> Yeah. So, like, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be a slam dunk, but, like, I don't know. Cards like this have been reasonably successful in the past, and I think, like, this card seems much better than Frostburn Weird to me, for example. Huh. Like, you also get to loot whenever you hit them. That's a big deal. Yeah. All right, let's move on to black. First up, we have the Bone Dragon. Five mana, five, four, Dragon Skeleton for three black, black. Pass flying. And for three black black and exile seven other cards from your graveyard, put it into the battlefield, or take it from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Liam. Uh, yeah, this is like a, a powerful card. It's hard to kill. I think if you're gonna play it, you wanna play it in a deck that's not looking to tax the graveyard in a lot of other ways. Yeah. Uh, Cause I don't think playing a five mana five four flyer on its own is enough. Um, but this ability is like very sweet and super powerful. So I think you'll see some Bone Dragons around. I think that yeah. it's powerful enough to see yeah. some play. Worth mentioning, it doesn't have the disclaimer must be activated as sorcery or something no, like yeah, that. No, yeah, you can, can do, do it on your end step. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is pretty sweet. Next up, we have the Death Baron. Three mana, two, two, zombie wizard for one black, black. Skeletons you control and other zombies you control get plus one, plus one, and death touch. Chair. This is probably the best zombie lord, maybe. I'm not too up on zombie lords, but... <laughs> Wait, it's, we're it's we're missing a, an important cast member yeah. for evaluating this card. Yeah, it's, it's also a, a reprint. So like, uh, Alex, what do you think? It's nuts! Yeah, it's, <laughs> it only goes in one deck, and that deck is zombies. <laughs> Correct. There's Sweet. not a skeletons deck yet. No. Even uh, even Liam's not willing to... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Bone Dragon. Is a skeleton. I agree, Graham. I, <laughs> look, I'm willing to go out on a lot of lines. Some would argue too many. And, uh, yes. yeah, yeah. So, notable, if you manage to give Death Baron the skeleton subtype, it does Anthem itself. It does Lord itself. Because it's only other zombies you control, but skeletons you control. See what I'm saying? Good eye, Judge Surge. Thank you. That's what I do. <laughs> Next up, we have the Demon of Catastrophes. Four mana, six, six demon for two black, black. That It's very, very common printing. They've tried to do this card a number of different ways. This one's 
special addition is as an additional cost to cast this creature, you have to sack another creature. Flying and trample. Jer. Uh, I did Death Baron, didn't I? Yep. Liam. Uh, yeah, this card's interesting. Uh, as you said, they've tried to print this like uh, set of abilities and power and toughness combination a bunch of times with some kind of caveat, and like most of the time, the caveat makes it unplayable. In fact, all the time so far, it's made it, it's made it unplayable. You in, can't in, win in, in Highlander at least. <laughs> yeah. Well, like Desecration Demon's close, I think. Like, yeah, it's the closest one. Like if sure. you wanted to play, like Desecration Demon, Demon's a card I would like gladly advocate for playing as a budget inclusion if you didn't have if you didn't have everything uh, that you wanted for a deck yet. But uh, this card, I think, is pretty good, actually. Yeah, okay. Um, in particular, I think in, like, a green-based deck yeah, where you I can, like... Yeah, or Yeah, something. exactly. Use your mana dorks to accelerate in the early game, and then you get to cash one of them in to cast this massive threat. Um, that's pretty good. Obviously, there's blow-up potential. You know, if they, if they counterspell this, it sucks. If yeah. they kill this it right away, it sucks. This is Slam Aristocrats for me. You think so, eh? Hmm. Yep. Hmm. You're just planning to like sacrifice something for value and then Regardless, kill yeah. them with this 6-6. Six, six. Yeah, the nice like, thing about this one is it has no downside once it's in play, which is not something yeah. the other ones include. But sorry, go ahead, Jer. Yeah, I just think the ability to like basically nullify the downside on this card and the upside's so big. And one thing you can do with aristocrats is often like force them to use your the removal spells on your the creatures they don't want to remove especially yep. their hard removal spells because like if you've ever played against aristocrats you're like heavily incentivized to burn your swords and path your exile removal early hmm. to stop them like starting to go crazy like, uh, huh. there's a bunch of early creatures you have to kill right away like if they have a creature based sack outlet that you can remove you basically have to remove it if they have a blood artist creature in play you basically have to remove it and so like for a deck that basically blanks removal, they have a lot of must-kill things that they don't really care that die. Uh, so you're often actually able to stick your your huge threats. Hmm. They basically have to draw top deck removal. I also want to play Esper Tokens at one point. I, I think this would be good. Gets in there. Deck. Sweet. All right, let's move on. Next up, we have Isareth, the Awakener. This is a three-mana, three-three, that I'm um, waiting for Graham to pull the art up for because I don't know all the words. Well, because you jumped over G. What? Oh, I'm the worst. I have a card before this one. It's called the Graveyard Marshal. <laughs> Sorry, Graham. You're like, follow the list you gave me, Serge. It's, it's fine. Uh, black, black for a 3-2 zombie soldier uh, with the activated ability 2 and a black and exile a creature card from your graveyard. Create a tapped 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token. It is your turn now, right? Uh, I think it's strictly Jarrah's turn. What? I think it's mine. Yeah, how I did. I, I, I did. Gonna... I did Death Baron. Oh, it's did, because it's because you've been commenting on them and stuff like that. Sorry, you're right, Jerry. You're up. I'll I'll keep track of this. Forgive us for a little back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, this card's this card's pretty good. Uh, the activation cost is pretty high, so I don't know how often you're activating it, but it is nice to be able to get some some value from your graveyard. Uh, I don't know how how strong it is. The black black cost is pretty pretty prohibitive, so you're not going to be able to play it in even two color decks unless your base black is going to be pretty hard. So I just don't know if there's really a home for it. All right, all right. And is the Rift the Awakener is in the flavor text of this card, and is also our next card. Three mana, three three, one black black, legendary human wizard has death touch, and whenever the long name attacks, you may pay X. When you do, return target creature with CMC cost X from your graveyard to the battlefield with a corpse counter on it. If that creature would leave the battlefield, exile it instead. Liam. I'm really confused by why there's a corpse counter involved in this. But okay. Is it for flavor? Is it, there other things that yeah, care about actually, corpses? I have a judge question about that. Yeah. If you bring a creature back <gasps> with a corpse counter on it and Isareth leaves the battlefield... Does it do anything? Like, if it dies, do you still exile it? Is that what the counter's for? Or is that only if Isareth is still in play? I can also, while you're looking that up, <laughs> something I discovered during the pre-pre-release, yeah. thankfully not during a game, but beforehand, is that uh, Isareth does not make the creatures zombies. This is not Rise no. from the Grave. No. no, no, no which is a shame. They just have a corpse counter on them. But yeah, I don't understand either. I just don't know why there's a counter involved. Anyway, so... I think it still gets exiled. And that's what makes sense to me as well, but let's find the... the oh, right, the comp rules aren't out yet, so I'm going to have to check my documents here. So, talking about this there's card from a, a Highlander standpoint, yeah. 
Um, one black black is a tough mana cost to hit. Not a lot of decks do so. Uh, but if you can hit it, this effect is reasonably powerful. The death touch means that it's not free to block this, uh, and it's big enough that it's pretty obnoxious to block. Um, you, you're going to have to stick probably a creature of similar mana cost, so it's, it's almost always going to trade evenly, and if you get to also bring something back, you're potentially trading up uh, by, by sort of getting some value there. I don't know if there's a deck for this card yet. Um, like Similarly, when Alesha, who smiles at death, was printed, that was a card we talked about a little bit, and, and it's seen some play, uh, and, and that, that card has a very similar text box to uh, Isareth. So, I don't know, I think this card will be interesting, but... I um, Black Mold that's looking for a lot of recursion already, maybe? Maybe, I don't know. It's, it's hard to evaluate, I think. I think it's just going to have to be something that people try more than anything else. I'm not sure I, I have the tools to evaluate yet, just because it's kind of a unique effect. So, Graham, I have two things for you. One, if Isareth leaves the battlefield, the replacement effect continues to apply. So, yes, they will be exiled. But two, uh, probably a follow-up question, if you somehow remove the corpse counter, it will still affect. It's just there to help remind you. It, that, 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 that counter has no game value. It's just there as a reminder. Huh. Yeah. Neat. Well, thank you. But if you, if you make the creature a new object... Then it'll work. Yeah, if you like if you, flicker it or something like that. Yeah, because if you flicker it, if that it creature get... would leave the battlefield, exile it instead. Battlefield or go to the graveyard. If that creature they, would... they... Oh, sorry. Let me put it. Let me put his wreath back up. There you go. Yeah. So oh, we'll leave can... the battlefield. We yeah, can't. They phrased oh, yeah. it as a way in a way. So Never mind. Wait, our, our our tricks are no good here, Jer. Yeah. Exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. What if it's going into exile? Oh, it's a replacement ability. Yeah. You're right. It doesn't right. work. Can't, yeah. Can't game it. Can't. No goozling. No, no Goozle Reno. <laughs> no Goozle. <laughs> All right, uh, let us move on. Next up, we have the Black Planeswalker, Liliana, untouched by death. Four mana for two and a black, enters play with four loyalty, plus one. Put the top three cards of your library into the graveyard. If at least one is a zombie, each opponent loses two life, you gain two life. Minus two, target creature gets minus X, minus X, where X is the number of zombies you control until end of turn, pardon me, not permanently. And minus three, you may cast zombie cards from your graveyard this turn. Jer. Uh, all right, so th this card is obviously pretty narrow. Uh, it says it says the word zombie a lot, and I haven't played that deck, so I'm, I'm not gonna judge too hard. But to me, even in a zombie deck, this doesn't seem very strong. It's plus one, doesn't give you any advantage. It, like, maybe maybe drains for two. It does sort of fuel the minus three, but it's it's medium at best, I think. Hmm. The minus two is pretty good if you have a board, but once again, it's conditional on you. You having a board doesn't do anything if you just got wrathed or something. Yeah. And the minus three is pretty good, but, like, if you didn't hit on your plus one and your things haven't died, it's not doing anything. So even in a zombie deck, to me, this this isn't super strong. The tricky thing about a zombie deck is they're often pretty low to the ground, too. Yeah. So there's not even a lot of turns where you can cast Liliana and minus three and get a lot of recursion out of it in the same turn, because, mm -hmm. you know, what's the most mana you realistically have is maybe seven if you flood it out super hard. Yeah. That's so it's optimistic. a little bit tricky. All right. Next up, we have Plague Mare, another one of the horse friends. Nightmare Horse, uh, three mana, two, two for one black, black can't be blocked by white creatures, and when it ETBs, creatures your opponent controls. Gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. Liam. Um, yeah, so this is another powerful uh, kind of color-hate card. Um, it's going to be reasonable against the go-wide decks, like elves and, and white. I don't think this is a slam dunk by any means. I think there are other effects which are, are similarly powerful, but this is something that if your metagame contains a bunch of X1 creatures that you could definitely put into your deck, and, it, and it's going to be reasonable for you. Yeah, kills true name. Yeah, I think these types of effects are pretty pretty underrated. I think Orzhov Pontiff throughout its its sort of career in Highlander has been underplayed. So I, I'd be excited to see how much this card gets played. I like the effect just because of the dominance. I mean, maybe not as much nowadays, but like Goblins is a deck you might encounter. Hoof is a deck you're probably going to goblins, encounter. Goblins doesn't really see play anymore. Even your even your stupid Jeskai deck that you beat me with on Monday had a lot of X ones. If I had cast this on your board when you had a Vendelian clique out and tricked by whatever that other three nimble one, obstructionist, nimble obstructionist, and 
You also had Young uh, Pyromancer. Young Pyromancer. Oh, his board was dis I like I would have 18 for one hit with this thing, and instead I just died. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have I think oh another reprint we were going to talk about. I was going to say our first reprint, but that would be wrong. We're going to talk about Duress. One mana black sorcery for a single black. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-creature, non-land card from it. That player discards it. Jer. Uh, this card is great. It's the third best discard spell. Uh, typically, people in, are playing black and wanting to interact with their opponent's hand will always play Thoughtseize is the best one. Then Inquisition of Kozilek is usually second best. Duress is usually third best. Uh, sometimes two and three get mixed up depending on your meta. But... Yep. Yeah, this is this card super playable. All right. And our last black card we want to talk about today is Infernal Reckoning. For one black instant, exile target colorless creature, you gain life equal to its power. Liam. Yeah, so this is a big blowout card, but it's too narrow for Highlander. So this is another one like Isolate that's very cool and interesting, but there's just not enough colorless creatures to target in the format, and you can't afford to play cards that are going to be just completely dead in matchups. Um, so this card's really interesting, and if... I mean, if you want to be nasty and your friend is like has built this Eldrazi deck or only plays our only plays this like artifact aggro deck and you play each other all the time, sure, go nuts. But in a regular tournament, you can't play this card. But Blue Moon, it kills exactly one creature in their deck. Correct. Yeah, and then they'll if, kill if, you anyway if they play it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Let us move to the color red. First up, we have Banefire X in red sorcery. Banefire deals X to any target, the new templating. If X is five or more, the spell can't be countered and the damage can't be prevented. Jer. This card is really good at killing control opponents unless they have mixed direction. It's also a reprint. Uh, it's one of the best fireballs. You should probably play this one. Yeah, yeah if you're gonna play any fireball, play Banefire. Sometimes Comet Storm's better, but. <laughs> Fair. All right, next up we have the Dark Dweller Oracle. This is a 2-mana two 2-2 two, two Goblin Shaman for 1 in red. 1, and sack a creature. Exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. Liam. Um, this is kind of an interesting card. It lets you convert creatures that are either dying to removal spells or creatures that are no longer impactful on the board uh, into potential cards, which is sort of cool. It's a goblin, so it probably fits into the goblins deck. They're, they often have disposable bodies. Um, I don't think this card's like insane insane, but I, I'm interested to see where people play it. Yeah. All right. Demanding Dragon. Five mana, five, five dragon for three red red. Flying. When Demanding Dragon enters the battlefield, it deals five damage to target opponent unless they sack a creature. Jair. Uh So this is a Punisher card, but I actually think it's one of the best <clears throat> Punisher cards they've ever printed. Uh, the five mana, five, five flying body is super good. Uh, it either kills their worst creature or the one they care the least about or on an empty board or if they don't want to sacrifice a creature it basically has haste and gets to block yeah both scenarios are are pretty good and the body makes it good enough to play i think next up we have goblin instigator oh. <laughs> i believe this is the uh yeah. two mana one one for one and a red etb get a second body make another one one red goblin token liam this is sort of like Mog War Marshal. It's obviously worse, but the Goblins deck still wants this. It's also a rogue, so it you know fits into that Prowl deck. Um, it's basically just another Krenko's Commander, Dragon yeah. Fodder. Yeah, exactly. I think I like this better, though, because you can Cavern a Soul with it. Yep. Uh, it, it comes off of... Um, Aether Vial. Um, not only Aether Vial, but Ringleader. Recruiter, Ringleader. Like, there's a bunch of things that this just interacts better than Kranko's Command. Yep. So, I think it's... It's a reasonable card. I think it's a, a step better than There are a, lot more, those, a lot more negates than Essence Scatters running around. Yeah, but they're probably going to play all of those anyways. Uh, next up, we have the Goblin Trash Master, our new Goblin Lord. You guys like that name? It's, it's a pretty, pretty hilarious, hilarious name. Yeah. Four mana, three, three for two red, red. Goblin Warrior. Other goblins you control get plus one, plus one, and sack a goblin, destroy an artifact. Jer? Uh, yeah, so this is a really nice goblin lord. You wish it cost one less mana, and yeah. it was like a 2-2 two -two or something, but you know what? We'll take it. Uh, the sacrifice the goblin to destroy an artifact ability is very relevant and, mm -hmm. and worthwhile text. Gets played in goblins, exactly. <laughs> Next up, we have Gutter Snipe. Three mana, two, two, for two and a red. Goblin Shaman. 
Do have we named any? Yeah, with dragon. Dragon and goblin are like the only creatures we're talking about here. And sorcery. Oh, uh, yeah, creatures. creatures. Yeah. Uh, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, gutter snipe deals two damage to each opponent. Liam. Yeah. So this is a card that's kind of interesting in uh, like a spell centric deck. I've seen people play it in, in sort of blue red tempo or aggro control before. I've seen people play it in blue red control before. Just making it so that every spell you play pressures your opponent's nice. This is really a a creature that tends to be a bit of a lightning rod for removal. You do have to kill it, yeah. or it is going to kill you eventually. Um, it's not insane, but it's it's good. You know, it's a card that's that's worth playing around with. And if you're a deck that has a bunch of spells, this is definitely a card you can you can look to play. Let's talk about the red planeswalker, Sarkhan Fireblood. This one's interesting. Three mana, one red red, three loyalty, plus one. You may discard a card if you do draw a card. Second plus one. Add two mana in any combination of colors. Spend this to only cast dragon spells. Minus seven, you get four, five, five dragons with flying. What do you think about this card, Jer? Uh, I'm also not super high on this Planeswalker. Uh, I think it's slightly better than Liliana, but not by a whole lot. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the second ability, like, mostly doesn't exist. You'll get to use it sometimes. Like, because, like, even in a dragon deck, you can only play so many dragons. Yeah. And if you're playing a, a dragon deck, it's likely not mono-red, so this is pretty hard to cast. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, uh, the fact that the, the, the second plus one lets you color fix is kind of neat. Yeah, but I just mean in terms of actually casting okay. Sarkhan. Like, like, if you're building a dragon deck, you're probably at least Grixis, if not, more, if not like, four color, no white. Yeah. So just, like, being able to cast one red-red on turn three is like probably a stretch uh the other plus one being a rummage not a loot yeah which means you discard <laughs> first is another like not not super exciting ability uh the minus seven is really good but once again it takes five turns to get there and i just don't really think it's doing enough for you up until that point yep. all right i agree all right let's talk about spit flame three mana instant spell deals four damage a target creature for two and a red Whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay red. If you do, return spit, fan, spit flame from your graveyard to your hand. Liam. How many jokes about people's mixtapes do you think are going to be made with this card? Like I, a lot, right? I hadn't thought about that at all. Wow. Yeah. What? Do you, what like, what's your album, man? I don't know. I just spit it's flame. Just spit flame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to cast my mixtape on you. Um, <laughs> so this card's interesting because... It's a good removal spell because it's instant speed, four damage, and four is a threshold that matters a lot. Yeah. Uh, we typically view four toughness as safe from a lot of removal, and, and this gets to break that kind of rule. The second clause where when a dragon enters, you can pay a red and get it back um, is where this card gets challenging to evaluate because it's hard to know exactly how many dragons are going to be uh, possible to play in a deck. Um, I think that there's like some black red midrange decks that play uh, like eight or nine dragons where this card could be pretty good that are going to want recurring removal. But I don't think this is a card that's get, that gets into every deck, for instance. Do you need to recur to this to play it? Yes. Like, you're, you're not happy casting this no, once just, in a game, just, right? No, just, just three mana Flame Slash at instant speed isn't good enough. Um, you'd rather play a card like Roast. But if, I think if you have a, a reasonable shout of, of recurring this once, then it becomes pretty reasonable. I don't, right. think, I don't think you have, this has to be some card that you recur four or five times. Yeah. I think you just have to do it once for it to be worth it. All right, next up we have Alpine Moon. One mana... Just a red enchantment. As it enters the battlefield, choose a non-basic land card name. Lands your opponent, only your opponent, not symmetrical. Control the chosen name, lose all land types and abilities, and they gain add one mana of any color. Jer. Uh, so I just don't think this card is, is playable in Highlander. There aren't yeah. enough lands that you care about. Uh, Tron is not playable in this format. No. This card was clearly printed to beat Tron in Modern, and I'm not even sure it's going to do that. Wow. Uh, I think it's pretty good against that, but this, is, that's a different podcast. It is pretty good against Tron. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and the last card we want to talk about here is Thud. 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 One mana red sorcery as an additional cost to cast a spell, sack a creature. Thud deals damage equal to the sacrificed creature's power to any target. God, Liam. The name and art on this card are great. Yeah. This, and this, even, the, even the flavor text is also excellent. Give him a push. Yeah. It's all very good. Um, so this is just fling, but sorcery speed and one mana cheaper. And there's not yet some kind of fling combo that's especially good, but 
if one is to develop, Thud is definitely uh, an important card for that kind of deck because yeah. it's just like a mana is a big deal. All of a sudden, like one thing I was saying is like you can do something like cast Might of Lara, give a creature 5 5, then cast Berserk to make it a 10 10, then Thud to throw it, right? And now all of a sudden, instead of that costing 4 mana, it costs 3. So you can now potentially have a fourth mana for protection spell. You can have set up the combo on that turn, like cast a tutor that turn and, and then done this all. Um, so it's interesting for sure. I, it's still pr almost certainly not good enough, but um, <laughs> but it's just like it's it's a it's it's a card that's worth talking about and it's a card that's worth keeping in your head as new things get printed. Sure. So that was it for the red cards. And honestly, team, I'm looking at the time and I'm looking at the number of cards we have, and I'm thinking. I'm thinking we might want to split this into two, because sure. we've got like 30 cards left to go. And that gives us a chance uh, to get your feedback. So specifically on the colors that we've already done, Wooburg up to green. If there's a card that you think we've missed that you want us to talk about, let us know down in the comments. And we'll follow that. And then we'll do a follow-up episode, which is going to have green, gold, artifacts, and land. And that gives us a bunch to talk about. But let us move to our normal closing segment. B -b 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 I didn't get a powerful magic song for me today. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, and up today is me, because I haven't got to do one of these in like almost two months. So uh, something that I never got to experience before, but maybe maybe those of you who've been playing magic a, a little bit more than I have have done this before. Did you know that they changed the rules for Blood Moon? Yes. You, you're, you're familiar with this one, Jer? Yes. I, I knew it in theory, but I hadn't really experienced it. So I was sitting there on Monday night and uh, uh, playing against my opponent who was on just a beautiful deck. They were on uh, um, Red Black Prison, uh, Splashing Blue only for Academy, just, just, just for the mana. And I was like, a, a player after my own heart. Uh, and they cast Blood Moon against me when right. I had a basic forest in play. And I looked in my hand at what was in my hand, but lo and behold, Dark Depths. And I was just like, oh. I had to call a judge. I wasn't sure. My heart was racing. <laughs> I was like, am I, am I going to live the dream? Because oh, you know what else was in my hand? Some kind of disenchant, no doubt. Age. Maelstrom Pulse. Yeah. A little bit awkward because I didn't have the, bla the basic swamp. But I was just like, I can hold on. I hope. I, I've got enough time. What's, what's the worst that could happen? And I'm like, uh, I see. Goblin Rattle Master. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's the worst that could happen, maybe. Yeah. So all of a sudden, they're... Fast they're their clock's pretty quick here. Goblin Rabble Master, first turn hits you for one. Second turn hits you for four. Yes. Like, this thing starts ramping up damage pretty quick. So they are on, like, a three-turn clock against me here. Maybe four. Four-turn clock. And they're just like, all right, how, how many turns until I can get a Black Source and then not die? Um, and then two turns, turns out, is the answer. I got Crop Rotation. Okay. And I was like, okay, I still think I'm dead. Goblin Rabble Master is racing me to death here. Yeah. Then I ripped Toxic Deluge off the top. Uh -huh. And I had enough to do Deluge for two. Right. Then Maelstrom Pulse. My my uh, Dark Good Depths blood. immediately becomes the 2020 Spaghetti Monster Merit Lodge. Yep. And then my opponent's just like, all right, good game. <laughs> yeah, not too much there. But I finally got to experience game. it. It's the dream. Because everyone was saying, once Blood Moon came out, they're like, yo, Surge, you know that Dark Depths doesn't enter with counters now? And I was like, oh my god! Yeah, I've been sort of theory crafting a Magus of the Moon Dark Depths deck. Yeah. So, to, to explain to people who might not be familiar with this, um, with the old wording on Blood Moon, even though Dark Depths entered as a mountain, it would still enter with the ten well, counters on it. The wording on Blood Moon is the, is the same. It's just... Sure, they, right. They changed the rules pertaining how things with abilities enter play when they're going to be not that thing in play. <laughs> you want to elaborate and give maybe an example? Uh, yeah, so for example... Dark uh, Depths. Yeah, <laughs> a good one. Dark That's depths. the example. So under the old rules, Dark Depths, things that say as they as they enter play or comes into play with still worked. So yeah. like, if you had a shock land, you still had to pay two life for it to come into play untapped as a mountain Yeah. with, with Blood Moon or Dark Depths would enter play with 10 counters on this mountain. Uh, a lot of lands would still enter play tapped, like creature lands would enter play e tapped. Exactly. And it was unintuitive to be like, well, this is a mountain. Why do I still have to well, follow the other text? There's sort of, it, de it depends. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not sure calling it intuitive is fair. Okay. But yeah, under, under the new rules, things that 
come into play as or come into play with are treated in terms of them already being in play. So they have the characteristics, how they would be in play. Yeah. And if they're not that thing, they're not going to be that thing in play. They don't get to enter with their things or enter as their thing. That's fair. I, anyways, I got to live the dream. I was really happy about that. Have, you, have other of you I've experienced not that yet? I have not. I have not cracked open a Dark Depths by killing my opponent's Blood Moon. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was well. Of course, you have to play the Blood Moon into their. You have to play the Dark Depths into their Blood yeah, Moon, yeah. make them sweat a little, right? <laughs> well, anyways, that's our episode for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the first half of our set review. We originally were planning to try and do this in one, but uh, we got talking about the cards, and I like that. I like the pace that we were doing, and it gives a reminder. Uh, those of you watching at home, a chance to, to give us some feedback. Any cards that you want us to talk about you think we missed? Uh, any cards you think we got wrong? Let us know. Uh, send us a message down in the comments. And we'll be back next week with the second half of our set review. So a reminder that this podcast is brought to you by you with your support over at the Patreon at patreon.com slash run. And as always, thank you so much, North 100. We'll see you next time.